This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. One day we hope to journey to new worlds, but once we are there, how will we travel around them? So a few months back, one of our newer editors, Jason Snyder, pointed out that while we spend a lot of time talking about how to travel to other worlds beyond our own, we generally don't spend much time talking about how we will actually travel around those places once there. And at my suggestion he submitted an excellent outline that serves as the basis for today's script, our chance to see how folks in the future might make their way around their distant homes. This was also about the same time my wife and I started taking flight lessons, and like a lot of folks I often enjoy the journey to places as much as the destination. Those long trips in a car, chatting with a friend or listening to an audiobook and seeing the scenery are some of the most pleasant and relaxing times, all at the same time, flying through the air can be exhilarating. Of course many planets have no air and while they might one day have roads, they don't now. So we'll be focusing on different techniques and circumstances, whether it's traveling in a vacuum or by blimp on Venus, or subglacial bullet trains or complex tether and orbital ring systems. We will approach it by looking at unique challenges and opportunities on each world, beginning with Mercury, then we'll move out world to world until we get to the Kuiper Belt and Pluto and its Acheron River and then we'll finish with a discussion of a few other systems which might end up on Earth, like power-beamed hypersonic craft and orbital ring networks. Each moon or planet we go to has different characteristics that ultimately define how we can travel around there, and Mercury is a great example of that. Mercury is an airless rock with gravity parallel to Mars, 38% of Earth normal, which may be enough to allow habitation there without any serious fears of health problems from low gravity. Mercury is a place of extremes, as close as it is to the Sun, you wouldn't expect there to be darkness, but the planet is in a 3-2 orbital resonance, meaning it spins on its axis three times for every two times it orbits the Sun, giving it a day of 59 Earth days and a year of 88 Earth days. This is not its daylight though, in the sense of how long the Sun is or is not in the sky because the orbit is nearly as fast as the rotation, causing it to take 176 days for Mercury to go from sunrise to sunrise. In other words, Mercury's daytime lasts one Mercury year, and its night is just as long, so the sun will rise on Mercury only twice in 2022, only twice in 2023, and so on, though this period is slightly less than half an Earth year. Furthermore, Mercury has a highly elliptical orbit, Earth doesn't orbit the Sun as a circle, but our elliptical path is nearly circular, so much so that even though Earth is at its closest to the Sun in January, the increased light has little effect on it being winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Not so with Mercury, its highly elliptical orbit is thought to be a major factor in why it is in a 3-2 orbital resonance, not a 1-1 or tidally locked, like Earth's moon is to Earth and virtually every moon is to its planet and also likely as most inner planets will be to their own suns in other solar systems, and as a result, we can really only talk about Mercury's weather in two Mercury year cycles, 362 Earth days, because for a given piece of the surface, its winter one year will be much hotter or colder than the previous year. The nights are deadly cold once the planet radiates its heat away, and the days murderously hot. You could travel near the day-night terminator to mitigate that as the sun moved across the sky, far larger than an Earth sky, and you could basically walk and keep up with this slow motion sunset and twilight, however the noontime temperatures would be pretty extreme even for robots and electronics, and this episode is not about unmanned travel anyway, so you either need to be out at night or maybe twilight, or walk around with a large reflective umbrella. In our episode Colonizing Mercury, we suggested mushroom habitats, places where the habitat was raised on insulated stilts above the ground and kept in the shadow of a large and movable reflective umbrella. We also suggested mobile mining platforms, huge miners, refineries, and villages on wheels moving with the sun, slowly, possibly with giant solar mass overhead, staying where they could use the sun near the horizon for power. 
A person lost on Mercury when the sun rises or sets has little choice but to dig in to the darkest crater they can find and wait for rescue. That might come in the form of a spaceship, but not a plane or helicopter. Your only option for slow-moving craft, rather than orbital ones, is either something padding along the ground on wheels, tracks, or legs, or some tether hanging from an orbital ring or skyhook, neither of which is easy to read it. We can't rule those out as options, though. In the absence of an atmosphere, a strong enough skyhook rotovator might be able to snag someone. See our Upward Bound series for more on skyhooks, and our Outward Bound series for episodes like Colonizing Mercury, Colonizing Venus, and many more we will revisit today. Similarly, we can't rule out fairly precisely targeted shells being fired from artillery pieces to provide a rescue pod of some sort, fired from far away, over the horizon. With a crater or big enough umbrella, with a power supply, solar or nuclear, and with a tent equivalent able to put you up on stilts and run a big radiator system, survival might be an option even if rescue was days or even weeks away. It's all about how much food you have and how good your air and water recycling in your suit or tent is. Power might be nuclear or it might be a solar panel on a long telescoping rod, able to reach above a crater wall. You might be able to recharge your vehicle in a crater, then race to catch back up with the day-night terminator, do it again, and so on, migrating with the twilight around the planet. As for ground vehicles, wheels and tracks certainly are options, but Mercury is a place where legs, bipedal or more of a spider chassis, is a real option for vehicles too. Legs with feet that aren't thermally conductive let you walk around a hot landscape, while lack of oxygen means hauling around a giant umbrella over your head for shade is viable, there's no air resistance. Both robotic and manned vehicles are possible, even under the bright noon sun, and this might be anything from a fast insulated vehicle on very sturdy wheels to something like an exoskeleton of stilt legs and an umbrella overhead. Mercury is one of many examples of places where point-to-point travel is likely to be by rail and probably underground. Though we should note that in the absence of air and strong gravity, it would often be easier to build a surface rail under reflective shades and solar panels than an actual underground tunnel. That lack of air though probably encouraged you to put a thick cover above to protect the rail from micrometeors. So too, even though Mercury seems like an ideal place for solar, we shouldn't ignore options like nuclear power. Given that Mercury is burned by a sun ten times as bright as Earth and without any deadly radiation filtered out by an atmosphere, options for radioactive power supplies for during the 88-day darkness don't really seem so bad. When it comes to analogies for desert travel, there's no place like Mercury when it comes to similarities. The day is hot and the night's cold, they're just a couple hundred times longer, there is no water, and here there's not even air. Keep to shadows and craters and remember that on Mercury, the sun hates you more than it does vampires. Moving out to Venus, here it shares a similarity with Mercury in that it is deadly hot and has a freakishly long day. Venus spins slowly and spins backward, we theorize it might have been hit by something big in the past to cause that. The year is normal enough, it takes 225 days to orbit the sun, or 16 Venusian days is about one Earth decade. But the day is 243 of ours, longer than its year, at least in terms of completing a rotation, with the sun rising in the west, not the east. The real day is about 117 Earth days between two sunrises, still a very long time, and that's a very long sunrise, almost two hours for every minute of sun movement we normally see here in our sky. You can't see that sunrise from the surface of Venus, the atmosphere is too thick, making Earth look practically airless in comparison, plus your eyeballs would have melted along with the rest of you. Venus is not a place of extremes like Mercury, it's just hot. Most colonization efforts for Venus focus either on building floating cities far up in the sky and moving around by gliders, planes, or blimps such as we looked at in colonizing Venus or involve a distant future where Venus is placed under solar shades, like we looked at in Winter on Venus. Now we can hypothesize big super-insulated vehicles trudging across Venus's surface, employing virtually unimaginable efforts at cooling, run on fission power or dump down a superconducting orbital tether, 
However, for today we'll focus on air travel, as Venus is one of only 8 places in our solar system where there is an atmosphere where flight is plausible, and 4 of those are gas giants. You also have frigid Titan, Earth itself, and the thin but flight viable red planet with its dust storms. On Venus, the atmosphere finally drops to a pressure similar to Earth's surface pressure at about 50 kilometers up, about 30 miles, some distance above the clouds made of sulfuric acid. Here we could fill balloons with an Earth-like air mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and would float just fine because the atmosphere of Venus is principally carbon dioxide, which is heavier than air, allowing it to float like helium does here on Earth, and helium works even better as a lifting gas on Venus. Personal homes might easily be a blimp that had a turbine on it pushing it to keep up with the sun, which creeps across the world at literal walking speed even down at the equator. Up closer to the poles, where the sunlight would be more Earth-like in its intensity, the speed of day is even slower. So a house blimp roofed with solar panels should have no problem keeping up with the light. Now you could hang glide, especially if you had some engine and some solar panels on that glider, to make it a powered aircraft, but there is still some sulfuric acid up there, albeit rather diminished, so there is a need for either a protective suit or for you to be inside an aircraft, and you would need an air supply, but all of this should be far less bulky than a normal spacesuit. Now you can just dump a plane out the side of a blimp and expect it to get a decent speed as it fell, it's a long way down, but landing is another matter, so you might see planes limited to places where they had long blimp runways or could inflate one temporarily. So long as your ship can handle the rising temperature and pressure as you descend, you can dip below to gain speed, and parachutes and inflatable lighter than air sections are options, allowing submarine-like travel deeper under the sky or for a plane to slow and stop mid-air by just becoming a blimp. This could be a great place for a helicopter too, to limit the need for runways to land on, or a VTOL craft, though Venus's gravity is 90% of Earth normal, so flight is not that much easier. We might see some interesting airship hybrids too, such as the Helistat, which is something of a helicopter and blimp hybrid. And nitrogen and oxygen gas are far more abundant than helium, and far easier to keep from leaking through your ship's skin, making them better options. On Earth, planes tend to be wet wing, which means the wing is a fuel tank itself, rather than containing one, and they might be on Venus too, but we might see buoyant wings instead, though slightly compressed oxygen serving as your fuel oxidizer might be used too. Of course we have some material limits as well, you probably do not want to use aluminum fuselages or airframes, aluminum reacts with sulfuric acid. Glass and polycarbonate are pretty resistant to sulfuric acid, and there's plenty of reasonably lightweight materials we might build planes out of there. Venus definitely has some better options for traveling around so long as you don't mind air travel. If you do, Venus is not for you, and unlike on Earth, where we say it isn't the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop, on Venus, it is the fall that kills you. Indeed, due to the thicker air and lower gravity, the terminal velocity is about 40 kilometers per hour or 25 miles per hour, so the only reason landing will kill you would be because you landed in the proverbial and literal frying pan. It would take you over an hour to fall, and while you would likely be dead long before you hit, a rescue might be possible for several minutes. For any rescuers, brave humans or robots, willing to make the dive to get you. Your emergency measure though might be an acid-proof balloon connected to your air tank, able to inflate and float above you to safer regions. Any such deep dive planes are likely to better resemble a submarine than a plane, thick hulled blimps or powered aircraft. Venus is likely to be a place where many types of aircraft dreamed up on Earth are viable, just don't fall out of them. We will come back to Earth and the Moon at the end. For now, let's skip past it out to Mars. On the Red Planet, airplanes are possible but there's very little air and it's not oxygen, so you can't really run an air-breathing engine there, and you need higher speeds to achieve lift. This dwarfs the advantage of the lower gravity. You've got little sunlight, which is already too diffuse on Earth to really be used for powering flight, and unless we find hidden pockets of Martian coal or oil left over from some life that might have existed there long ago, we're out of luck on fossil fuels. 
Though we have found trace amounts of methane, whose origins are still rather mysterious, and we may find pockets of it we could exploit. Nonetheless, jets on Mars don't seem as viable as on Earth. I suspect major air travel there would be in the form of something like a scramjet powered by microwave energy being beamed in from orbitals or ground sources. We discussed this technique more in our Upward Bound episode on beam-powered spacecraft, and given that we discussed that as a real option for people on Earth to own hypersonic personal space planes for getting to space around Earth, I could easily imagine them getting perfected here and deployed on Mars too. Space-based solar power, which gets around weather and dust storm issues, as well as nighttime, generally involves beaming the energy down as microwaves, so having it able to target aircraft with already existing assets, powering bases below seems a potentially good way to allow many distant small communities to operate and interact without necessarily needing nuclear-powered houses or rovers or planes. Of course that's also an option, we use plenty of nuclear on Mars, and it's got some big advantages. Problem is, when it comes to vehicles, nuclear fission reactors are not terribly mobile or safe for layman users. Truth be told, neither is a normal combustion engine, but there is a bit of a difference between one of those and nuclear car engines. As we get out to Mars and places further from the Sun, methods of beaming power or using nuclear become more important for vehicles, otherwise you've got fuel cells or batteries, all needing to be recharged. RTGs, radioisotope thermal generators, while stupidly simple, very durable, and very long-lasting, really are not very power-dense. The MMRTG used on Martian rovers like Curiosity and Perseverance has a 110 watt output, and at 45 kilograms that's a power density of 2.8 watts per kilogram. That is less than even fairly old and sturdily built solar panels, though it works at night and in dust storms and on Mars where the Sun is weaker. Nonetheless, MMRTGs, while excellently reliable power supplies, needing no refueling for many years, still make an engine on your lawnmower or chainsaw look like beefy powerhouses, and way more than either. In conjunction with batteries, you could have a RTG-powered rover, and more so on lower gravity worlds, but its only real advantage over solar is that you can travel during the day and charge at night whereas you could carry portable solar panels on your rover and put them out to recharge it in the day and travel at night instead. I would expect, honestly, to see a combo of both. Also, there are isotopes that give off more power from less mass in exchange for shorter service lives than the plutonium isotope in the MMRTG. These rovers probably need to be fairly bulky too, they need insulation and maybe even an airlock, so the idea of running them on RTGs and batteries seems more like how you would run a short distance ATV for inspecting your perimeter or carrying some equipment and people to an outpost, with the assumption the RTG is recharging the battery between use. A nuclear fission powered landship seems more probable, running on some very miniaturized and reliable fission reactor to roll over the terrain. These could be down the size range of a large RV or one of those behemoth super tanks like the Land Cruiser P-500 Monster or the Char 2C. In an environment with little air, requiring a pressurized hull and lower gravity, super heavy tanks might be more useful than we found them after their relatively cool looking but lackluster battlefield performances of World War I and II. Another cool thing about a landship big enough for its own nuclear reactor is that it can serve as a recharger for other vehicles, rovers, or pickets that accompany it, or by direct plug into electric powered trailers and haulers that move with it, either hitched or having a connected power cable some distance away. That allows each to maneuver around the Martian terrain, or to form a long chain behind a good pathfinder, which might be the Vanguard Scout or something with a big bulldozer on the front of it. There are no roads or train tracks on Mars yet, and so too on Mars you don't have to go over bodies of water like on Earth, and you can't get stuck in the mud because the surface water for mud is just not there. You do have to be somewhat careful about sand traps, but that should be easy enough to figure out. A limiting factor on size is, if you want to get around quickly, you're going to need to clear paths for these landships to get around. The bigger the path you need, the more work you need to do to clear that path. So then you start thinking about how big a vehicle you need. A small modular nuclear reactor is still kind of big, especially with all the shielding you need around it. 
To carry humans, you need both radiation shielding around the vehicle, as well as a pressure vessel and thermal insulation to make it nice and cozy inside, and an environment where crews can operate for extended periods. Eventually, long before we see open air I'd think, we would see trains on malls or even highways with recharging stations for electric battery powered engines. Generally these will be things that come after Mars is home to tens of millions of people or more. Both work great there, electric trains or electric cars on highways lined with solar panel powered charging stations or long superconducting cables from nuclear plants back in civilization. But in the early days, I could easily imagine lots of small dune buggy style rovers or immense nuclear landships crawling over the horizon and through the dust storms and they do seem strangely appropriate to the Red Planet. Now as we move out to the asteroid belt and gas giants, a few major paradigm shifts happen. First, while solar power is still viable even out past Saturn, it's getting very weak and starts requiring amplification, such as big cheap reflective parabolic dishes focused on smaller panels or solar thermal generators, so nuclear options become much more important. And to be honest, I really can't see fusion power ever getting tiny, it's sort of the nature of fusion that bigger is better. Of course, as of this episode's writing, there's no functioning fusion reactors of any size smaller than stars, so it is premature to rule out personal vehicle sized fusion reactors. If you get them, then any place you can find something to use as propellant, which can literally be anything you can vaporize, gas, ice, rock, or whichever, you can run a personal vehicle that is essentially the classic awesome sci-fi spaceship, able to act like some best of all worlds shuttle, space plane, plane, helicopter, boat, etc. In the absence of that, as we head out deeper, you've got nuclear, you've got batteries, and you've got power beaming, and that's not exhaustive. We have some other variants such as sending out a stream of fuel particles or oxygen, which might also be magnetically caught and slowed down to provide power. How you charge those batteries can vary, and I should also note that in a lot of applications, there is nothing preventing you from dragging along a long power cable either. Indeed, long cable umbilicals would probably be common, connecting a human and their fellow crew members or various drone assistants to the bigger vehicle they travel in, allowing smaller batteries or air and water tanks in a personal suit. You would still have those as a backup if your cord got severed and in case you need to go a ways away from your vehicle or camp. So too you might have specialized drones that came along with you, carrying extra battery power or air, or guns to protect you from the Yeti living the ice caves of Callisto. Now this requires a big caveat because the problem in the inner system was a lack of fossil fuels and that there was no oxygen to burn. In the outer system, methane, the most basic of hydrocarbons, is all over the place, and so is oxygen in the form of rock or ice. This doesn't make for a good primary power source, but it works just fine as a portable power source being created by bigger power plants at your base extracting oxygen and methane, or regular hydrogen for that matter, from the local environment to be used as a portable fuel. So a big dune buggy with oxygen tanks for breathing and burning, and tanks of methane, can definitely roll around the low gravity moons of Jupiter, and all that low gravity makes it much easier to armor up your hull for radiation protection and to keep your air and heat inside, indeed your radiation shielding is likely to be made of your fuel and oxidizer. As I mentioned earlier, many planes on Earth are wet wing, meaning the wing is just a big fuel tank shaped as an airfoil. For spacecraft or surface craft on airless moons soaked in solar radiation, expect the hull plating to be of the same dual purpose design, hollow compartments full of your effectively radiation proof consumables, which help protect you from radiation now too. For that matter, not every environment out there is airless vacuum. Europa has long been suspected of having subsurface oceans deep below the ice, and we suspect that might be true of other moons such as Callisto and Triton, and of course Saturn's aptly named largest moon, Titan, has an atmosphere thicker than Earth's and seas below, and they just aren't made of breathable air or liquid water. Personal submarines or bigger subs are options in these places, and indeed would work better than on Earth, as the pressure is far slower rising with depth on low gravity worlds. It is also likely there are caverns and lava tube systems in any number of asteroids, icy moons and Kuiper Belt objects. These are far more easily shored up in low gravity, 
potentially with ice or some concrete equivalent we might figure out. We also might get way better at drilling caverns or simply melting them, there's a lot of icy moons and asteroids deep out in space with kilometers thick ice sheets. Not to mention all those dwarf planets. The handful in the asteroid belt, Ceres, Vesta, and a few others, depending on where you draw the line on size, likely have underground tubes and caverns which would be of great interest to us. All those other dwarf planets, from Pluto to the dozen or more others at last count, all the way out to far out and far far out, are likely to be shot full of underground liquid or gas pockets, and would be easy to melt tunnels through too. Needless to say, in none of these deep sea or underground caverns are you getting solar power or beamed power, you either run it down cables or you bring it in by battery or by fuel and oxidizer. Of course you might be using vehicles inside underground chambers you pressurized, that could be a bit tricky to do, but some chamber deep inside an asteroid or moon or comet might make a very nice home, or area to build a home in. Given how low the gravity in such places, even Pluto's gravity is only 6% of Earth's and most have far lower gravity than even Pluto, a pressurized area permits flight by personal rocket pack or wings. Such a rocket pack might simply be dry ice vaporizing, not some dangerous combustion. I should also note that low gravity allows interesting connection paths too. For instance, while sci-fi regularly shows asteroids ridiculously close together compared to how it is in reality, it's relatively easy to move them together and bind them with cables and tethers. You could cram dozens of small asteroids together, connected by tethers or even tubes people could walk, swim, or fly through. This potentially allows an archipelago-like community to form of various asteroid habitats, not to mention their various space stations and spaceships, manufactories, and solar panels. Indeed, as we saw in our episode Colonizing Pluto, this can be made at a grand scale. Pluto and its largest moon, Charon, happen to be in a double tidal lock, so that both keep the same face showing to each other as they orbit. They are also very nearly circular in that orbit, so it is possible to build a space elevator stretching right from Pluto to Charon, and indeed it is easier than building one to space from Earth. In that episode we pointed out that it might get very large, potentially including rotating habitats along its length or even being one itself, and in that episode we named it the Acheron River. Now as we often note on this show, science fiction has given us a bit of planetary chauvinism, as we always seem to see humans colonizing large planets, even when there's barely one small city on them there, and skipping all the minor planets of which there are around a million in our solar system alone, and also skipping the option for building artificial space habitats like O'Neill Cylinders, which we might anticipate being as easy to build as to terraform an equivalent amount of a planet, I feel like we would be remiss not to mention how you would navigate around these. Now we already mentioned how we could have tethers running directly between them, or even pressurized walkways, possibly even fairly thick trunks rotating to provide some gravity. Also in the absence of real gravity and air, you can own a personal spaceship, able to jump a few thousand kilometers between some closed asteroid or cylinder habitats that should be no more difficult to manufacture or operate than a car or land rover. You might even use solar sails or laser assisted ones from your hab to sail around habitats, or even around inside some, as many may be hollow and even without air. Inside them though we have some other options. Big cylinder habitats with centrifugal force acting as their gravity have low gravity centers and will likely have tethers running down from these to the ground below. For that matter, cylinder habitats aren't limited to the ground and axis, they can have multiple levels inside or partial levels in the form of platforms along those tethers, and the gravity would be lower on these. Indeed I would not be surprised if a lot of cylinder habitats had skyscrapers that rose all the way to the central axis like spokes on a wheel and had a long axis structure running out to external spaceports. You might have a tether in each town or even house that you could ride up to the axis and some form of train there. On these cylinder habitats we can have all the regular roads and planes of Earth too, but on long megastructures, many of which can run thousands or even millions of kilometers in length, vacuum trains on the external hull is an option, allowing speeds of thousands of kilometers per hour, or even tens of thousands. Megastructures and habitats are not limited to spin gravity either. 
Low or no gravity habitats permit skyships, jetpacks using combustion or pressurized gas, artificial or cybernetic wings, and many more. And of course many people may be traveling digitally, moving around their world remotely via drones or androids, or even inside digital worlds and virtual realities. Now last month in our episode Moon, Mega City, we talked about ways you could use deep tunnels cut through the cores of planets, or even skimming their crusts, to drop people or cargo through to distant locations for zero energy. Needless to say, that's easy on a planetoid with no molten core, but long tunnels taking advantage of vacuums and gravity may be very common features of travel around other worlds. On the one hand, we might be better to assume an energy-rich civilization. This one, a fusion-powered one, likely sees huge numbers of gas refineries in the atmospheres of gas giants, floating there, or seeming to float there in some cases, such as the Neptunian chainsaw we looked at in Colonizing Neptune, a huge orbital ring bucket excavator complete with hanging chandelier cities. Such structures rely on active support, power-hungry methods of mega-engineering relying on energy abundance or superconducting materials, and they give us the option for towers that rise up over skyscrapers like skyscrapers do over regular houses, reaching right into space, or huge non-rotating orbital rings hanging right over a world, connected to it by tethers that cable cars from many cities in its footprint could use to reach it, and from it, any other ring it intersects and any city in either's footprint. This allows rapid access to any place on a world or in its orbit, and represents the ultimate in planetary transport infrastructure, indeed you can even build planets out of them. On the flip side of all of that, I should note that walking is likely to always be an option too. And in theory, you could walk to any place on a planet if it had a complete orbital ring and space tower network, though that is a lot of flights of stairs to climb. Such methods can be extended in extreme cases to allow a direct walk between planets, though given that it's millions of miles, it would be your distant descendants reaching them. Also, before we close out, we probably shouldn't rule out the possibility of even better transport methods around a planet, like teleportation or gates between planets appearing as windows or closets in homes. However, those are topics for another time. For now, even though we have seen many cool options that we might use to travel around worlds in the future, all we know about traveling to other worlds for now is that first, we have to get there. And to paraphrase the first man to ever set foot on another world's famous first comment, we may need to do that one small step at a time. So today's episode featured a lot of concepts for traveling around worlds and traveling to them, and one critical concept to all of those is the importance of math and science. Problem is, for a lot of folks, learning math was a chore as a kid, not a fun experience and they don't really want to invest time in learning more math, especially if it feels like it might be time wasted, making little progress. Maybe that's someone you know, maybe that's you, but if you're looking for a way to learn math faster, better, and while you're actually having fun, let me recommend Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive STEM learning platform that helps you truly understand concepts in math, science, and computer science by guiding you through engaging hands-on courses, and if you feel stuck, Brilliant provides in-depth explanations to break down the material for you even more. For instance, Brilliant's new everyday math class takes you through foundational subjects with their trademark interactivity. A lot of people have struggled with fractions, but when you approach them in a visual way, they make a lot more sense. With Brilliant, you'll be presented bite-sized pieces that you can learn at your own pace when and where you want. To get started for free, visit Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur or click on the link in the description, and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So we're done for today but not for the month, as we still have our live stream Q&A coming up this weekend, Sunday April 24th at 4pm Eastern Time, and then we'll close the month out with a look at the concept of a technological singularity, an artificial intelligence of stunning capability appearing seemingly overnight, and ask if that outcome is inevitable. After that we'll spring into May to examine the idea of alien intelligences that are so ancient and advanced they are seemingly godlike. Then we'll ask about how we might get some air travel on Mars by giving it an atmosphere it can keep, and that means we need to make a magnetosphere for Mars. 
Now, if you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button, share it with others, and leave a comment below. You can also join the conversation on any of our social media forums, find our audio-only versions of the show, or donate to support future episodes, and all those options and more are listed in the links in the episode description. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week!